Okay. Okay, welcome everyone, whoever is joining us right now. Um, it will be great if you um, could switch on your cameras just for um, some time. Um, we have Professor Shilbury with us right now, and uh, we will begin our session in five minutes, but it would be great to know from you guys at this point of time um, as to what you are excited about for today's session, why are you in this webinar? So if anyone wants to sort of just raise their hand or unmute themselves, we'd love to hear from you guys. Aviraj, Jaydev, um, Mahatram. No one wants to say anything. <laughs> They're still joining in, I think, but. Okay. Hi, Zorabar, Sukhan. Okay, perfect. Now I am able to see a few of them. Hi, Zarabar. Hi, Shatakshi. Please tell me if I'm pronouncing your own name incorrectly. Uh, the pronunciation is Satakshi. Satakshi, right? Perfect. Yeah. So, Satakshi, why don't you uh, let us know to begin with what are you, why are you here for this webinar? What sort of prompted you to come here and what we are you excited to, to learn? learn? That's why I'm here. Yeah, I'm very excited to know that uh, something new I'm going to learn today. So that's why I'm very excited. Today. Okay, and are you an athlete, Shatakshi? Yes, sir. I got, uh, I, I like to play football. And uh, I got uh, two times uh, gold medal in football and marathon race. And you run marathons as well? Yeah, yeah sure. Very cool, very cool. So, Robert, what about you? What are you excited to learn today? I'm excited to learn about the sport, about sports, about what all you can do in sports and about not only the athletic option, but also uh, economically and vis-a-vis -vis business. Okay, wow. That is sort of the crux uh, <laughs> if professor wants to correct me, but I think that is the crux of the entire talk today. It sounds like he could do the lecture today. <laughs> he can. So Robert is one of our um, sort of uh, very enthusiastic. I know he, he rides horses. He does play a little bit of squash. Um, but I, I think we're all very excited to learn more about what are our sort of options rather than turning pro. Um, to study, yeah. of course, sports management and uh, what all sports can lead us to. Um, yeah. Again, at this point of time, guys, please I would request just a couple of more minutes for you to switch on your cameras, if you can, to see Professor Shilbury face to face. To awesome, I got Neve as well. Hi, Neve, um, and and just interact with the professor right before we dive into the sort of the more technical. Um, deep stuff. Um, it's just good to have a chat for the professor to know about you guys. What are your thoughts? What are your um, sort of aspirations? And hopefully that will help him uh, to go through the lecture in, in a much better fashion. Uh, what about you, Ni? Why don't you sort of just introduce yourself? Tell us if you are an athlete, what sport you play, if any, and what are you planning to learn today? Um, I think uh, my thing is very similar to Zarawa, like... Um, yeah, I am an athlete, uh, national level kickboxer and ex state level cricketer. But other than actually playing the sport, I wanted to, well, I was obviously interested in a career in something related to sports, uh, but I didn't really, I don't have much knowledge about other options other than actually playing there. Or something. So, yeah. And, and can I ask uh, of those that have spoken so far, at what age they are or what level of school last year? Or, or what? Neve? Uh, 14, 19. 14, thank you. 13, uh, 8th grade. Okay, good. 
Uh, even I'm 13 in eighth grade. Yeah, go on. Mm -hmm. I think that was Mahatram. Uh, but Shatakshi, what, what, how old are you? Which grade are you in? I'm in class eight uh, and I'm 13. Okay. 13. Yeah. All right. They look, they, they, they're very mature young people. They look older than that. It must be the camera. <laughs> True, true. Hi, Prisha. I see you're here as well. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Prisha, just, you're one of our last uh, lone warriors. Would love for you to switch on your camera if you can and tell us, um, do you play a sport? Uh, which sport, if, if at yes, all? What are you I excited play, to learn today? I play lawn tennis and I've been playing it for eight years. I play it at the national level and I'm 16, 11th grade. Wow, wonderful. Good. Thank you for that. Awesome. Okay, well, um, thank you guys for all, firstly, who all have made it so today. Um, you guys are punctual, so thank you for that. Um, hopefully, we'll have a few more people um, joining in after uh, a quick introduction about myself. I'm Rishi Jalan. I'm the CEO founder of the Big Red Group. Uh, of course, we have Professor Shilbury with us today uh, talking about demystifying sports management, sports in general, the world of sports, and of course, um, the career in sports. I think um, as a young athlete myself, um, I used to play squash for India in the juniors. I played the world championships, played uh, the US Open, British Open, all these tournaments. And I always thought, um, what would I do if I do not turn pro? And I took the easy route, which was going to a good American college um, for my education and then, you know, studying economics again, because it was the safest option. Uh, but I think in the last 12 to 13 years, of course, a lot has changed. In the world of sports, I remember when I was going to the U.S. for the first year uh, was the year that IPL had just started in India. Um, of course, that was just the beginning with one sport. Um, today, we have leagues in more than 10 sports, if I'm not mistaken, in India and, of course, around the world. And would love to know, um, you know, again, as an athlete, what are some of our options once we graduate from school? And hopefully, Professor Shilbury is here to demystify a lot of concepts and have a cool conversation with you guys. So I would request all of you um, to please re raise your hand, unmute yourself. We do want this to be um, not just a one-way interaction, but hopefully you guys, um, you know, get to learn from Professor, you know, just have an interaction and a cool chat with him. So having said that, welcome once again. And again, uh, really, uh, we would like to thank Professor Chaudhary for taking the time out at 7.30 p.m. in Australia right now. So I know it's late evening there, Professor, for you, but welcome um, for this great webinar and over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to join you. Uh, it's, um, how do I say this? I've been to India, I think eight times over the years. And of course, there's the state of the world just at the moment. Um, it doesn't look like I'll be able to get back anytime soon. I'm not, not even allowed to leave my country at the moment. So it's interesting times and tough times. And I, you know, I, I hope that uh, those of you who have joined us tonight were able to escape some of the you know, scenes that I saw in India earlier this year, which was quite devastating. So I hope, hope you're all okay on that front. Now, I'm going to talk over the next hour uh, about sport management mainly, although I will give you a little bit of insight to a few other courses and Eric careers as we go. And I'm really pleased to see, just checking beforehand, we have uh, some students at 13, 14, 16, and thereabouts. So people are clearly interested in thinking about what they might do after um, they leave school. And, and that's really good to start thinking about these things now. And sport's one of those areas of life in which people typically are very passionate and attached to. And it's not surprising that they want to know more about what goes on in sport and maybe a possible career in the sport. Now you probably notice as I do this presentation, I kind of look into the left of, or the right of my screen because that's where I can see some of you uh, down the side rather than looking directly at the screen. So I want to apologize for that, but I like to see some reaction from those of you who are watching and that helps me to see whether I've got somebody who would like to ask a question or indeed respond to some questions that I might have and I'd like to try and do it that way. It's a little bit hard virtually, but I can see some of you. And when, when someone raises their hand or has a question, 
they'll come up on the screen so that I can see you. And we'll, we'll just need to be a bit patient for that. And I do see one hand up already. Is it, is it how do I say this? Mahath, is that right, Mahath? Yes, sir. Have you, you'd like to ask something? Yeah, are you into a sport, a particular sport? Am I, sorry, say that again, please. Uh, are you into a particular sport? Oh, you mean me personally, what I play? Yeah. Yeah, let me talk a little bit about my background and I'll start with that question. So my background in sport as a player is cricket and golf. And I like to play a bit of table tennis. Mm -hmm. But I, and obviously I don't play cricket anymore, but I still play golf. And in more recent times, I like to ride my bike a lot. So there's a bit, fair bit of physical activity uh, on the bike. And one of the things that we've learned over the years in, in the sport business is that the people who play and enjoy a sport will typically then watch the professional sport of that type. So if you're a cricketer, you're obviously going to watch the IPL and watch India beat Australia and England sometimes. If you're into um, golf, then you're going to be watching different things, um, watching some of the, There's a couple of really good Indian players on the uh, European tour and, and PGA tour at the moment that I've seen in recent times. So these are the people that you would watch because you, you're familiar with the sport and, and you've obviously got some passion towards it. So that, that's my background sporting-wise. Um, so I work, as you can see, at Deakin University. I'm a professor of sport management. I've been there, for, this is my 32nd year at Deakin University. And in a few moments in one of the slides, I'm going to show you what part of Australia that where, where Deakin University is, <coughs> well, where, it, where it's located. And I uh, came from Perth in Western Australia originally where I worked, and this, this will be interesting for you, I worked in cricket. Surprise, surprise, I had a passion for cricket. I ended up working in cricket. I worked for local government as a recreational leisure officer and also worked in golf. And what two sports do I play? Or did I play cricket and golf? So there's a connection there. But one of the, here's the first lesson of sport management. One of the things that I learned very early on, if you want to work in the sport of your passion, then it's possible that that, that, your, that sport is when you're working in it five days a week or six days a week, some of that passion can be lost. You need to be more objective and a little bit more detached from the, from, from the playing of the sport to make good decisions, if I can put it that way. And that's one of the first things we teach our students at, at, at the university is to separate yourself from being a fan if you're working in the sport, because there's so much emotion involved. Now, I see another hand up. You've got a question? Is that, that's, um, how do I say it? Sh sh Shatakshi. Shatakshi, yeah. Question? Yes, sir. My question is, why did you choose sport management as your career? A, a good question. Um, I love sport. That was two, two reasons. I love sport and I knew, and this, how do you know these things? I knew instinctively that I had um, some innate ability to understand sport and make good decisions in sport. Now, this is really strange because everyone in sport thinks that they can do that because that's the nature of sport. And you know, I guess you try these things and you find out whether that's really true. But I, in a sense, I've made my lifelong passion, my career passion as well, and the evidence is there, 32 years doing this job at Deakin University. All jobs have their ups and downs, whatever type of job you want to do. But I've, got the, I've had the best job in the world. And, and, and before I came to Deakin, as I said, I had sort of five, six, eight years of working in other sports. So you know, it's a 40, 40 year, 40 plus year career across the sport business, which is also in, involve some, some work in India and understanding the Indian sports system um, and other parts of the world. And I've got to travel the world as a, as a result of the job as well. And that's been a bonus, not just to see, you know, the Taj Mahal and all these wonderful things, to understand how other people live in different parts of the world. And sport's a universal game. Everyone in the world, 
we'll come to the Olympics in a minute, but everyone in the world has got athletes and swimmers and basketball players. That's, it's quite a universal and, and common language. So, so that's a little bit about my background and, and why I came to be it. The real question is, why did I choose to be uh, like a, a, a professor at a university instead of working in sport? And that's an interesting question because I came to a view early on that I thought I could make more difference to a changing sports system by educating the next generation of graduates. And that's now turned out to be 30 odd years. And, and, and that, that's, that has happened. But our graduate, we've got 2,000 odd graduates from our programs and a lot of them are working in sports all over the country and parts of the world making a difference to the sports system, way more than I could have done as one person in any one sport. Good question. I want you to have a look, quick look at that, the picture that you see. See the picture of the, the, I think it's a soccer pitch or a rugby field, I can't quite tell, but you see all the spectators and what's going on there? Yeah. I want you to just quickly, if someone can tell me, just think about what's going on there. All the people have got into the stadium, they're watching the event. What sort of jobs do you think are necessary for that event to occur? Have a, have a think about that. What sort of things do you think people would need to be doing as jobs to make this sport event happen? Any ideas? All quiet. What about the, the pitch in the middle? What happens? What happens? What? I know, there's someone. A hand went up somewhere. Who was that? Siva, is it? Uh, yeah. I, um, can I like can I answer the previous question? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah, I think like for the um stadium, like you the picture you're showing, like the like the stadium managers, the see like coaches, referees. Good. And the. Concession servers and good, all the announcers and good, yep, referees and all the especially the athletes in the game, yeah. And all of these people are getting paid as uh, to put on this spectacle. And there's probably a lot of others as well. There's people that have cut the law, cut the grass, set the pitch up, marked it. Um, umpires, referees, coaches. You you mentioned some of those. So there's a lot of things that go on to put on a a, a good sport event. And there's a lot of jobs and a lot of careers uh, involved in that. And I just wanted to make that point um, from the outset that we, we go as spectators to watch these events and, so, and we don't often think about the number of people that are working to put it on. And for those of you who are interested in careers in sport, there could be something in something like um, this event, for example, which you could have a career. And th thinking about the selling of the tickets beforehand, somebody's involved in selling the tickets and the managing the computers and all setting up the systems and all these sorts of things. So that's a little snapshot as an insight into um, what I'd like you to think a little bit about tonight. All right, what I'm going to try and do in the next 40 odd minutes, because I'd like to leave some time for questions if we can, is just talk to you a little, just show you where Deakin University is so you know where I'm coming from. Talk a bit about the sport industry, um, give you a snapshot of our sport courses at Deakin so that you can see what some of the career options you might have in terms of study. Talk about specifically sport management, sport development, career jobs and opportunities. Um, again, come back to what we offer at Deakin in terms of our courses and, and some of the defining characteristics. Now, when you look at the picture also on the right, who can tell me where that, that lit up ball comes from? Where did you see that recently? Olympic. Where's that? Sorry? Olympic. Olympics, yeah, that's the magnificent um, a set of drone, drones that came together to make that unbelievable ball as part of the Olympic opening ceremony. Somebody's worked on that for, I don't know, years to bring it together. It was just amazing. And, you know, I'm going to refer to the Olympics a few times tonight because, you know, the Olympics is a massive event and employs a lot of people. All right, here we are. How many, anyone been to Australia? 
all quiet. Well, your day will come, yeah, one. Well. <laughs> so you see the red arrow? Right down in that bottom yellow little part that says Victoria, the arrow points to Melbourne, that's where I'm from. And guess what? All the way up the top is where you guys are. About a 10 hour flight um, from Melbourne to get to a Mumbai or Delhi, typically, roughly. So it's not too bad, but this is, this is the, the wonders of the modern world. We can talk to each other on, on Zoom um, and be in different countries halfway around the world. So that's where I'm from. And the university itself, um, it's a pretty, pretty good university. It's ranked in the top 2% of universities worldwide. It's a pretty young university. So young universities tend to do more progressive things than the older, more traditional universities. We are one of the largest universities in Australia. We've got around about 62,000 people involved. Now, the trouble with that figure is that, that you folks from India, with your population, 62,000 doesn't seem much at all, does it? <laughs> um, for the past six years, Deakin's been ranked number one in Victoria, which is the state that I'm from, for student satisfaction. And one of the features of Deakin um, is like we're doing tonight, is we have a very strong online teaching presence. And in the current COVID situation, we've had no option. All the universities in Australia and probably most of the world have had to teach online because we haven't been able to have students in the classroom because of COVID restrictions. And at the moment, we're in the middle of a, in Sydney and, and Melbourne, um, COVID outbreaks and we're all in lockdown. I know you know about that. Now, what are some examples? Let's have a look at some things to get you a bit fired up and start thinking about um, jobs and what people do. Um, I'm going to try and play a YouTube video. And I think if you're all muted, this should be fine in terms of the quality of the sound and so forth. So let's see how we go. I've got two, two in this slide to get through. And we might just have to put up with the ad that comes up first up. Can you see that? Um, no, Professor, you might have to open the new tab, which you have opened through YouTube or something that's coming up. Oh, okay. So it's not, it's not, I'm going to. Yeah, we, we still see the slides, which are there. Okay. So I'd have to stop the screen share and change it, wouldn't I? Yes. Okay. So I can do that. This I can do. Now you can see it. That's correct. Perfect. All right. Can you turn up the volume, Professor? I think. Yeah. That's the maximum I can turn it up. You can't hear it? We can't hear it. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a shame. Uh, we'll have to uh, share uh, sound as well. Sorry? We'll have to share sound as well. Um, professor, otherwise you can alternatively share the link on the chat and maybe Rishi or I can... Yeah. Yeah. I can say that, Professor. Okay. All right. Let's do that. Good thinking. Copy. Chats. There it is, gone. Perfect. Uh, let's just put it up. So I stop sharing? Yeah, you can, Professor. Uh, and I'll bring the other one back up or, or leave it? Wait, wait a moment. Yeah, you can let it be right now. And uh... there you go. Great. Thank you. <laughs> but if you want to write essays that inspire, Okay. Messages. You've played franchise cricket all around the world. How does it compare to the IPL? I'm only going to play two minutes of this, so stop it after two minutes. Just hello. In Big Bash, go to the ground. There's crowds. Everyone is excited. They do autographs after. Fine, done. Before IPL game, you can't come to the pool. 
fans are there walking just to go to the bus. They're outside lining in the streets. And then the drive to one okay, in five minutes, they're all in the streets, totally different. I guess the real debate to be had is in the future, does a young Indian player want to be out there playing test match cricket or sat here in this dugout playing IPL and for the Mumbai Indians? Does he want to make the journey that the great VJ Merchant and Sunil Gavaskar and Sachin Tendulkar made and all the sacrifices that go with that journey? Or does he want to fast track himself to the riches of the IPL? Hello, how are you? D20 cricket here in Mumbai is the hottest ticket in town. Which is better, test matches or IPL? It was a bit of a downer on T20 cricket and IPL. People are saying it is the end of cricket as we know it. We should be embracing it, shouldn't we? I think as human beings, we're stubborn for change. If something is working, and someone comes up with a brilliant idea, the first thing, we are apprehensive. But now we have seen it's the way of the world, and we have to try to live with it and try to embrace it and embrace all forms of cricket. The evolution of cricket is changing, and again, we have to change with the world. You know, the mantra of when you were growing up, your coaches, etc., bat long and runs will come. Yeah. Now it is play a lot of shots and, and money will come with money. IPL deals. So yeah. are kids now looking at this, the IPL? Yeah, big time. Big time, but... The good news is, you know, the team I handle now, or uh, the youngsters I see, you go and ask them what they want, they want to play test cricket. That's fine. You are so Thanks. good. But you're dead. That's it, Professor, should I? Yep, that's it. Yeah, you can close that one off. Perfect. Thank you. And I'll just uh, bring this up again. Whoops. Yeah, we're good. All right, we're good. All right, so you saw, you know Ravi Shastri, all of you, I'm pretty sure. Very famous player. What's more important, yes, test, test, test cricket or IPL? Any, anyone? A Ma Mahan. Yes, go on. Test cricket. And why? Uh, it leads you to a global playground, playground where you get bigger opportunities. Okay. Anyone else got a different answer? So this is this is an example of one of the, the very difficult decisions that um, sport managers have to make. Do we spend our time and money on promoting test cricket or on the IPL? And they're different forms of the game. One's a, a much shorter version and a whole lot of entertainment um, crammed into three hours. And the other one's spread out over five days. These are decisions that sport managers need to make in terms of how they're developing their product and, and depending on who wants to come and to watch. You're all familiar with the IPL, I'm sure of it. I had another video with the Olympics. I won't show this one because I want to show two others soon that have got a bit of Australian flavour so you can get a bit more of a feel of Australia. Um, but the Olympic Games, which you all just saw recently, um, here's, you can see there just a few little facts, some facts and figures. 206 participating countries, 11,000 athletes, um, 369 record sets, 787 medals won, um, 15,000, normally 15,000 media attend the event. It's a massive industry in terms of a major event and the number of people that are actually employed to put on Olympic Games and the impact it can have on, have on a city in terms of rebuilding infrastructure and, and developing. Um, these are a significant social events as well as sporting events for any for any country. And you, you probably saw that in Tokyo, albeit again in middle middle of a pandemic, 
it was a bit difficult for the, the Japanese people to be allowed to come and watch the events, but you could see they were, they were interested where they could get a look, um, they wanted to have a look. So these are just examples of, of, of um, where careers exist. Here's a snapshot of the, the sport industry. There are jobs and careers in the sporting goods, manufacturing and retailing industry. Somebody's making cricket bats. Somebody's making Nike shoes. Somebody's making track suits. Somebody's making tennis rackets and golf clubs. It's all important part of the business. Um, government is important. In India, you have the Sports Authority of India, um, which a little, little bit of information there. That is like the policy making arm of government for sport in India. You've got the major events, including sport tourism, and I've just spoken about the Olympic Games. You also have Institute of Sports, where we have programs specifically to train elite athletes to be the very best they can at Olympic Games or for tennis or athletics or swimming or whatever the, the sport happens to be. And Institutes of Sport need people to manage the Institute and the programs and the policies and the money. And that's what we do in sport management. Sport marketing and promotion is, is very important. You see a lot of that through the IPL. Professional sports, you'll, you'll, you'll be familiar with obviously cricket, kabaddi in, in, in India um, and, and various other sports, which I'll come back to later. You have national and regional governing bodies, all of whom employ people um, to promote, to look after the money, to run major events, um, to develop the game and do all these sorts of things. Facility construction and facilities. We saw the facility in the first slide that I had. And of course, let's not forget all the sport media, TV, radio, newspapers, journalists, all are involved in the sport industry in lots of different ways. Now, if we can perhaps do what we just did, how many people have heard about the MCG? Just one. Yeah. So the MCG is like the one of the great stadiums of the world in Australia, and it's um, used for both cricket and the Australian Football League. And I'd just like to show two clips. And Sean, if we can do what we did before, I might bring it up and copy copy the clip, send it in into be, the paste, and we can do it that way. So let me just get it going. Then I'll stop it, clip it, and send it. There we go, that's gone. Yes, the stage is set, and what a stage it is. The Melbourne Cricket Ground, ready to host two teams of talent. Teams going around. We've got India and Australia. I can tell you now, walking onto this ground is very special. And in a World Cup final, it's something you cherish. So I'm sure there's plenty of nerves from both teams, plenty of excitement. And today is a day as a cricketer that you will remember forever. Young and old, men and women, boys and girls are in. We're expecting a huge crowd here at the MCG. It is going to be a brilliant way to celebrate International Women's Day. Plenty of icons here at the MCG. Congratulations. 
What did you notice about that? What was the crowd, crowd size? Anyone notice? More than like 50,000, 60,000 people. Huge. Huge, higher than that. So the MCG holds 100,000 people. Think about that from a ticketing exercise and, and selling and promoting. But on this day, there were nearly eight, there were just over 87,000 people from memory, or just under 87, one or the other, for, for the Women's World Cup. That, that's amazing. That's a world record for a women's, uh, women's sport event, as far as I, I recall, especially for cricket. And, and, and who won the match, by the way? Of course, Australia, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me, uh, let me do the same for this. I'm going to send another clip now or link. And where's the chats? There we go. This one's all for just about two minutes. I think this is worth seeing as well, just to get an insight into what's a uniquely Australian game, Australian rules football. Yes, say is sorry, I'll just uh, put it again. I just want to make sure. Yeah, okay. So a spectacular day with a spectacular event, the great grand final. Velocity, <laughs> Please put your hands together for Sir John Jones and Ed Sheeran, brought to you by Virgin Australia. Closing Albert Park Lake from the south end. Come back in by the MCG for one half left to deliver that. Flying high today is one of the players that has carried the 18 AFL teams on over 300 virgin flights this season. screen here. All right, so a full house, 100,000 people, crazy people. That's what sport does to people. And we as sport managers have to learn how we, we control crowds like that, manage people getting in and out. And when the team loses, sometimes people get upset. So we've got to think about security. There's all of these things going on, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a glimpse to Australia's greatest stadium and two of its biggest sports in very passionate crowds. And again, think about how many people have been employed in managing that match day experience 
But in the case of the World Cup cricket and the grand final day, how many people are employed to bring that all together across a tournament or a season? There are a lot of jobs, a lot of people, that things that people are doing um, in that. All right. Typically, then, what does this all mean in terms of jobs and what people do? This is a very broad sketch of what you can expect. At the top of most of our sports organisations, we have what we call boards of directors. These are people who often are volunteers and are overseeing how the sport is, 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 uh, is run. They don't manage the sport, but ultimately they're decision makers on the strategic direction of the sport and, and how the, the sport organisation performs. Usually you'll have a chief executive officer, you'll have a range of commercial and marketing people working in those sorts of areas that you can see, and a variety of administrative people working across finance, legal, human resources, IT, and other sorts of areas. You'll have event managers, and we've just seen two examples of massive events, and facility managers, same thing. On the playing side of the game, we'll have, you'll typically have high performance people who look after elite sport and people who look, work in developing the game by trying to encourage participation for people in the community. And that's a, 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 a broader snapshot of the sorts of jobs and things that people do in our, our business. Now, how do you get there? Well, increasingly, like most professions these days, it's usually a university degree that is the pathway to getting into one of these many jobs. Now, I'd like you to look at the, <coughs> the, where it says the Deakin Business School and under that, the Bachelor of Business Sport Management. So for, for those of you who are still at high school and thinking about what you might do in the future uh, and assuming that COVID passes by and we could start to travel again, we, we have Indian students who will come to us to complete the Bachelor of Business Sport Management, and that would take three years um, to complete. One of the benefits of traveling overseas, like I did to do my master's, I went to uh, the US to do my master's because at that time, there was no such thing as sport management in Australia. It shows you how old I am. Um, if you drop down from the Bachelor of Business down to the Master of Business Sport Management, we, we have hundreds of Indian students have been coming to us in recent years to complete that degree. I'm gonna show you an example of one of them um, a little later in this presentation. In the middle area, remember I just, I, I spoke a moment ago about uh, people working to develop participation and people playing. Well, this is what the Bachelor of Sport Development is about. It works more at a community club level to help clubs and help um, organizations bring people into the playing of the game. And in, in, in India, I know this happens a lot, but it typically happens through um, private providers, private companies who are doing the same sorts of things. If you drop down underneath that, you'll see the combined degree. Some of you may be more interested in the performance side of sport, but still have some interest in the business side of sport. And you can actually complete a bachelor of exercise and sports science, which is the performance side of sport. You know, how do muscles work and how do I understand movement to, to get better performance? And then you combine that with the Bachelor of Business Sport Management. I'm going to talk more about that degree very soon so that you can see uh, what's in there. Then we have our Faculty of Health, which you know, I've already mentioned the Bachelor of Exercise and Sports Science. That's where they deal with the performance and exercise side of, of sport in our university. So you can see the two differing sides of the equation. They're all, they all represent what goes on in the sport industry. Um, I, I have a question about the slide for this. Uh, uh, yeah. Over there, I saw a combined degree, but after, say I pick the combined degree, after completing the combined degree, is it possible to do a master's in one of the two? Or if yes. I want to do a master's, I have to go through the single? No. No, that's a good question. And the answer is from that combined degree, you can choose to do a master's wherever, whichever area you might wish, might wish to do so. Oh, okay, thanks. All right, let's get a little more into sport management. Um, I won't show this video because it'll mean it's uh, uh, the same as before. 
Now, I've, I've spoken about some of the jobs, but here's some of the things that uh, people are doing. But these are the foundations of sport managers. One thing that differentiates sport management from corporate type of work is that we work a lot with volunteers. We have to understand how to attract volunteers to help deliver sport, to retain them, and therefore we need to understand their motivations. So from a human resource management practice perspective, we need to understand why it is that volunteers want to volunteer to help uh, with sport. And I've already touched on most of the others um, in terms of or the one that perhaps I can, you know, alternate delivery um, um, sports. Um, how many people saw at the Olympics skateboarding, BMX, and some of these newer sports to the Olympic Games? But these, these, are, these sports typically have alternate delivery uh, modes of delivery in terms of the way they set themselves up. So we need to understand um, about their organisation and delivery as well. The rest of the, the, the boxes that I've spoken about, some of you may be old enough to remember the Delhi 2010 Commonwealth Games, another major event, and then we've got coming up next year the Birmingham Commonwealth Games, um, which of course we've also got a Winter Olympics coming up, so it's a busy year next year. Now this little quote, um, I want you to think about this. This, this, this quote tells us why sport, the sport business is unique. And it's unique, in this case, described through baseball because that's the person who, who provided this quote was talking about baseball. But it applies right across the sport spectrum. So it says, baseball is too much of a sport to be a business and too much of a business to be a sport. Does anyone know what that means or what do they think that means? Why is it a conundrum or why is it perplexing? Any ideas? What it means, what it means is that most corporate businesses um, are based on bottom line dollar results. But in sport, there's a social element to sport and an equity issue to sport that means that we don't always make decisions strictly on what it means for the bottom line or dollar, dollar outcomes. Uh, we need to retain the fun, passion, sporty elements of sport, but complement that with business without making it so much of a business that you forget about all the people that like to play and get involved with sport. Our challenge is to make sport available to as many people as we possibly can. What we typically see, and we see this in India, although in India it's evolving more than being developed at the moment, whereas in Australia it's a lot more developed. In Australia was 30, 40 years ago, kind of where India is, has been in the last uh, decade, but things in India are changing very quickly. So we have all the people that play play sport, that we call that mass participation. And you can see all the things that, the elements that go into it. You know, government has a role in providing facilities and funding, all the volunteers that get involved in helping deliver um, sport to communities, sports equipment, clothing, shoes, and so forth. And then we go to the top of the pyramid, which are the athletes that make it the very good elite athletes, and of course there's less of them than there are at the mass participation level. This is where we see all of the, the, the television and broadcasting of the IPL and of various sports events. We see government involved in attracting major events um, to countries like the Commonwealth Games back in 2010 in Delhi. We see um, corporate companies wanting to sponsor teams and athletes. And we see lots of paying spectators, and we've seen that in the videos already. And then at the top there, um, broadcasting, paying spectators and sponsorship basically is the business model for elite and professional sport. That's how we make money from it. And some of that money is then used to help um, promote participation in sport at the lower levels. 
That's, so that's very simple, the equation for sport managers to be working with. Very quickly, market structures can differ from countries, but in Australia, the big professional sports you can see there down under professional sports. And then there's examples of what we call tier two sports. A lot of them are, are, are Olympic sports, hockey, swimming, basketball, baseball, um, athletics, rowing, of course, you'll see very prominent at, at the Olympic Games. But most of them are not usually the big corporate dollar sports, but they have their moment in the sun every now and then. Other things that we need to be thinking about from a marketing point of view is how many people, percentage of the population, are interested or playing these particular sports. And that's how we work out how we uh, market and communicate with people. Um, and again, this is an Australian example, uh, but the same sort of thing will be going on in, in India. Australian rules football is our dominant winter professional code. In fact, it's the most professional sports code in the country. We have 18 teams in all the major cities around the, uh, the country. It's 150 years old, but it's only been a truly national competition played right across the country for the last 20 years. So some of the key metrics, and these are the sorts of metrics that we measure our success by in sport management. How many people watch the grand final on TV? Typically, it's more than 4 million. How many people buy season ticket holders? There's a million of them around the country. And average game attendance typically is about 35,000 at each game, which is about third or fourth in the world in terms of professional sports. And you'll see some other figures there in broadcasting, sponsorship and membership. These are the, 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 the dollar drivers for running these sport businesses and the sorts of things you need to understand if you work in this business in the future. <clears throat> Events and facilities are are, are crucial to be able to stage these big events. You've seen the MCG, you see it again there. You can see a picture of Melbourne Sporting Precinct there. It's just a mass, you know, you've got, you can see the MCG, what we've got we call Amy Park, which is like a soccer rugby pitch uh, over there. And then the sort of closer sections, you've got the um, tennis centre, which hosts, you can see that on the bottom as well host the Australian Tennis Open each year, which is a Grand Slam event and brings in enormous revenue over two weeks. And there's lots of people employed in that. And then down the bottom left, there is the Formula One Grand Prix, which hasn't been run for the last year or so because of COVID, but normally it's a March event and a massive event. These are all outlets for careers and jobs and working in different set parts of them the sector. So in terms of marketing sport, what are we trying to do? What we call it technically consumer behaviour, but it's very simply trying to understand what people like about sport. And I can ask you all what you like about sport and you, you tell me and that gives me a bit of a picture of how I might wish to promote my product. We were involved in promoting and delivering sport and services. We need to develop brands, um, all the IPL teams, the Mumbai Indians, whatever, they're all brands. Um, we need to understand how that works. We need, we, we, we're involved in forming partnerships and sponsorships. And talk, we're involved in negotiating TV rights deals and, and broadcast content. And of course, and an application in business and marketing analytics, understanding what people are watching, what they're doing, how they're responding to our sport. These are careers in sport. Then we've got all of the alternate delivery areas of sport, which I've touched on before. Skateboarding at Olympic Games for the first time. BMX we've seen. Um, there are other sport action types. Tough Mudder is another one. Um, I, I, the one down the bottom, I don't know whether that's, that might be UFC or something like that from memory, but there's a right, so many different sports, therefore so many different opportunities. Again, in terms of our program, because we're based in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne's the strongest, one of the, has typically been rated the best sports city in the world most years. And therefore, we have the advantage of being able to interact with a lot of them. And that's helped us get to the sort of top rank status of programs in the world uh, because we're right in the middle of uh, one of the best sports cities in the world and we make use of that. 
if you come to Deakin, what you get in the first instance is an integrated business degree. And that's important because it means that you can leave us with a Bachelor of Business Sport Management, but with the ability to work in either general business or in sport management. You might get a job in sport management to start, then move to general business and come back, or the other way around. But you get flexibility. Our students can do what we call a second major, which is a string of eight units in accounting or finance or marketing, for example, um, so that you, know, you can go home and tell mum and dad, you can be an accountant as well. Mum and dad are usually more interested in churning out accountants because they don't understand sometimes how big and wide the sport industry and sport business is these days. So you'll need to convince them after my talk. You can already tell from the time I've been at Deakin that we've got a lot, lot of experience in delivering sport programs at Deakin. I've said we're internationally ranked. We've got high quality students. I've mentioned we live in Australia's sporting capital. After 30 odd years, we've got many of our graduates are CEOs of big sport companies. And in terms of our study, um, I've spoken about um, online delivery and flexibility in, in terms of um, how we deliver. And as part of our course, we all have, we have a mandated what we call practical or internship type experience to ensure that you get out and work in a sport and understand um, how that is going and, and what that looks like. Um, oh, sorry, question. one more question. Yeah, um, you just talked about the integrated business degree, right? Is that different from what you talked about earlier, which is just completely sports business and sports? No, no. See the bachelor of business on the top of this slide. Yeah, that's okay, the so bachelor that's of business the, is the same as the. Yeah, that's the integrated uh, business degree in sport management that I'm referring to. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. Yep. I'm going to, I think I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. And as right now, here I am. Now can you, those of you who are getting close to finishing high school, thinking about these things, so a business degree, most business degrees, see all the, unit, the subjects in green? They're common, what we call core business studies. Someone, you always need to do some accounting or economics or finance. This is the grounding in our business degree. And, and you need to do it. But the fun stuff is, is in black. So I have eight units there that co comprise what we call our sport management major. And the first unit in sport organisation, we look at the way sport's organised and delivered across Australia in particular and then other parts of the world, including the Olympics, Commonwealth Games and these sorts of things. We also look in sport and society about the... What's the role of sport and society? How is, important? How is it important? Why is it important? How do we explain that? And we know it's important to so many people. In India and Australia, it's the same. Um, managing high-performance sport, we, we, we give our students an opportunity to have an insight into what it's like to work with elite athletes and coaches so that you understand that. And sport and law obviously um, links to the law, and you'll see... Um, uh, business law as one of the, the core business units. So that obviously leads under sport and the law. And, you know, subject, there's a lot of different subjects we deal in there in terms of intellectual property in relation to athletes, um, sporting tribunals and, and um, dealing with athletes who do things that are against the rules on field in a violent way, for example. So that's a really important subject. Then you've got the, what we call the sport operations Facility and event management, we've talked about that. Leadership and governance, which is about, remember that very top, top box of board of directors I showed earlier? It's about what those people do in overseeing the work of a sport organisation. Practicum I've mentioned, you get a two-week opportunity to work in a sport organisation and then sport marketing gives you all that understanding of why people like sport and what, what will bring them to come to the game or to play the game. Uh, and then there's, to round out 24 subjects of the degree, then you get eight free choices of subjects, which you might do a second major, like a full eight units of marketing or accounting or finance, depending on, on what you like. So there's flexibility there to do that. Any questions on that? No? Yeah. Good.
All right, so let me just quickly step you through. So we were the first university in Australia to offer integrated business degrees in sport management in the Faculty of Business. Most others have followed us since then. We look to provide students with the skills to work in the business of sport in all its forms, including professional sport, national and state sporting organisations and community sport. But it's this next one that's really important. This is what makes our field distinctive, the ability to apply management and marketing theories and business principles generally within a leisure framework is the defining feature of our degrees in sport management. Because people who come to sport come to it with a, they think about it's their leisure time. They're not thinking about it as being a business. And so we need to teach students to recognise that whilst you're working in the business as a professional, the people that are coming, it's their leisure time, they want to have fun. Or if they're playing, they want to have fun. And here's just a little a student profile, a quick example of one of our master's students, actually, um, Gautam, who, who graduated uh, when did, 2017. Uh, he's currently working, as you can see, in India um, for the Lakshian Academy of Sport. He was previously a senior research officer of sport at the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sport. And you can see a little bit of detail. He did internships at Golf Victoria and Squatch Australia while he was at Deakin University. He's obviously gone on to do some good things in Indian sport. And there's lots of opportunities emerging in Indian sport to, to make Indian sport a better place and develop it over the coming years. And we encourage our Indian students to think about when they go home to be doing just that, to, to live the dream of sport in India. Here's some more uh, examples of jobs that you could get from, from, by work, having done the Bachelor of Business or, or indeed our Master of Business Sport Management. Um, you'll see the top right on Business Development Management in Golf Australia. Um, Water Polo is a general manager of growth, which means participation. A customer service representatives at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. Um, that's we get a lot of tours. A lot of people come to tour the ground, but they probably do in some stadia in, in in India, and that's a business. You know, there's income there. A venue manager of a lake as a, of a leisure centre. There's the four, the the, the, the uh, tennis open manager of ticket sales and partnership, and of course Birmingham Commonwealth Games coming up. Someone needs to coordinate the. Uh, 30 or 40,000 volunteers I'll need to help to deliver the event. This is just, these are just examples. There are, of course, many others. Now, let me go through this pretty quickly because I think I'm running out of time, aren't I? You're good, Professor, but yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see how we go. These are just some examples of what's happening in India at the moment. You know, jobs as a sports agent, sports information director sports marketing managers, sport lecturers, and sport event managers. Now, you know, you'll know better than me whether those are dollar values, what they mean in terms of Indian life and, and society. Um, but it's just a bit of an insight to some of the jobs that are now available in India that probably weren't there 15 years ago. Things are changing um, pretty rapidly. And of course, it's because of the rise of professional sport leagues in India you know, the, the, the Professional Sport League made a belated entry to India 135 years after the first professional sport league in the USA. Um, the defunct Indian Fe Hockey Federation uh, led the, ultimately led to the Premier Hockey League in field hockey, um, and then that came just before the beginning of the IPL. And truth is, it's the IPL that was, has really brought the prominence to professional sport and exposure. Uh, etc. You've now, from what I can tell, got over 12 national professional sports leagues in India, and not surprising that the IPL is the most established and well known. But some of these you'll recognise, and there's others that I haven't got on the list. But you know, some of them reflect uh, sports that are special to India, like uh, uh, pro kabaddi, um, um, table tennis is very big in India, as is volleyball. Then you've got your major events that India is involved with in, in a, the Asian Games. There's the Chennai Open and Indian Open, but in golf and badminton, and of course the World Cup in cricket um, and other 
similar cricketer events. So the onset of the sport leagues and tournaments has led to this spike in interest around sports related careers. Uh, it provides the sport aspirants of today with the right avenues to realize their dream job, such as a full fulfilling career in sport management. Um, so I touched on the um, Bachelor of Business Sport Management with a Bachelor of Exercise Science. This is a four year degree as opposed to the three year degree that, that is just the Bachelor of Business Sport Management. And we take 16 subjects from the Bachelor of Business and 16 from Exercise and Sport Science and put them together over four years. This allows people who are not sure whether they want to be in performance side of sport or business to have a look at both and then make decisions um, once they graduate. Then we've got the Bachelor of Sport Development, which I won't spend too much time on now, but that's essentially a degree in which, which we look to work at the community and club level to promote participation. And that's something you might wish to think about as well. When we talk about sport development, we're talking about what it really means is how do we attract people to play? How do we transition them up to higher levels and, and retain them? And then for the very good ones, uh, how do we transition them to the pathway to elite and then nurture those elite athletes? And typically very successful athletes in countries, particularly in Olympic games or high profile sports, they tend to become role models. And people like to copy and do what, what they've done. And that's, that's how our sport business works is good performers lead to new ones who then enter at the attraction level. Here's just a few samples of jobs in sport development. You see subtle differences. These are all people that are, it talks about participation or game development, which is another way of saying participation, association development managers, etc. And you'll see the Indian student in the middle there from our master of business, uh, he's a participation coordinator actually at Badminton, Australia. So participation is important and it, and it has specific jobs, as you can see, as part of our, our industry. Ultimately, where do our sport management graduates go? Well, they go to national sports organisations. Um, you know, in Australia, that's 60 to 80 of them, and that's probably the same in India. Uh, about 60 of them are employed people at, in our country. Then each of our states has state sporting organisations. I think you've got about 28 states and eight unions or thereabouts. Um, a lot of them will have something similar. There's government organisations, and I've already spoken briefly about the Sports Authority of India. Player and athlete associations are becoming more and more prominent in our business. Player management organisations in terms of athlete management and, and negotiating contracts on behalf of athletes, coaches and these sorts of things the professional teams and leagues, all the event management side of the business and, and major events, facilities. We've, we've spoken about that a lot. Let's not forget about the apparel and sporting goods industry. There's research consultancies, and then of course there's brands and sponsorship and, and market research in all of this as well. So there's quite a diverse range of possibilities uh, for you to consider when the day comes. And on that note, I might stop right there and say thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk with you and meet with you. And if we've got time, I'm happy to, to address some, some questions if, if, if that's allowed. Thank you, Professor. We can uh, stop the screen share um, at this point of time. Um, perfect. Um, thank you for, for putting um, a lot of the sporting answers in terms of like the Indian context as well. Um, yeah. I would like to tell a lot of students that um, not just in terms of, you know, when you do go for a business uh, sports business degree, really, that you have to go um, and work for an organization. But as an entrepreneur, there are a lot of opportunities that are coming up where, um, you know, students, once they get to know what are, um, you know, some of the, I mean, pieces that are missing in the sporting um, arena and how as an entrepreneur, you can sort of work through it. Um, and, and get better. So on that note, do we have any questions for uh, Professor at this point of time? Uh, just one. 
just while they're thinking of question, Rishi, that's a really good point. One of the differences between Australia and India is that there's a lot more entrepreneurs in Indian sport because government doesn't do for sport what Australian government does for sport here. So that's that void is filled by entrepreneurial type people. Thank you. Yes, Neve, you, you had something to add. Yeah, I had a question about admissions and say um, getting into Deakin or getting into any other major sports institute. Yep. What what other things like for say other universities it's mostly you know marks and grades. Yeah. Uh, so let, uh, so let me let me tell you what it is for our domestic students because you'll have your own system of of how the gradings and so forth work. Students that score about 80 out of 100 across their subjects, the way it's, the way it's scored, typically get into our Bachelor of Business Sport Management. Now, I don't know if that gives you any relativity. International students, it's probably fair to say that that can drop down a bit lower. Um, so the best answer I can give to you is do well in your high school. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, you know, it's kind of ironic. You just want to be playing sport all the time, but actually you've got to do a bit of study as well. And in terms of extracurriculars and, um, you know, it's like, say sports and stuff, does that affect admissions or does that not really matter when it comes That's to a really good question. The answer is no. It doesn't affect admissions really because guess what? Just about everyone who applies for our sport program is coming out of a sport background because they love it. That doesn't mean they're all elite athletes, but they're all involved in sports somewhere. So it's not, it it's doesn't not, distinguish between people. It's not really a disadvantage if you have a little less than others. Or no, not at all. Not at all. Good question. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Aria has a question on scholarship, Professor. I do know that Deacon provides a lot of scholarship. I was uh, a part of a team uh, from India where we were selecting sort of one student each year for the undergraduate program um, to help them on, on a full scholarship. And then of course, offering um, a lot of yeah. other scholarship opportunities to students. Yeah. There's, there's about five, I think, vice chancellor scholarship for Indian students. And I've just seen, in fact, I should have include, included the, the picture in this presentation. There's a young girl um, coming to, to study with us who's just got one of these into the Bachelor of Business Sport Management. I've just forgotten what sport she was involved with, but there were there were two, there were about 10 across the university, I think, and two of them were coming into sport management, the Bachelor of Business Sport Management. So um, Rishi, the, you know, our India office, and you, you'd know Ravnit, of course, yeah. handles this, this particular scholarship. You might wish to communicate with Ravnit on, on all of that. I'll do that. I'll do that. But Arya, being very honest, uh, just feel free to send me an email and I can put you in touch with uh, sort of relevant people who do look at scholarships and they can sort of get you. But again, of course, making sure that you are in the top of your class, talking when you are talking about why you want to go to Deakin, really telling them what you plan to achieve um, from the university and telling them how you can contribute um, as a young athlete, as a young uh, sort of student, you know, of course, will help um, to get those scholarship opportunities uh, from the university. Yep. Um, but thank you for that question. And as I said, feel free to email me. I'm just putting my email out here as well. And uh, I'll be more than happy to connect you to anyone. Um, any other questions at this point of time? Okay, well, um, I think thank you so much, Professor, once again, for taking the time out um, and speaking with us. Um, as uh, Professor has just told all of you, um, we do have a lot of opportunities in sports rather than just turning pro, uh, whether yeah. that's you know management of, of leagues to becoming coaches to teaching about it, um, like the Professor is, and, and of course, um, working on the sidelines as um, you know, a, a sort of a physio, a trainer, performance enhancement, um, you know, people who are, who are there whom we sort of, again, who are sort of working in the, on the back end um, of athletes. So there are a lot of opportunities. Do not be scared. There are universities like Deakin and a lot of them in the US as well, um, who do provide you with, with a fusion of sports and, um, you know, a business degree. Um, hopefully you guys can Take advantage of it. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free 
to email us and uh, we'll be more than happy to put you in touch with the right pe deacon people um, in India. Uh, but on that note, Professor, any last words from your side before we end no. today's webinar? No, I've, I've really enjoyed the questions that have come forward today. It shows that as a group, we've got a group of people here who, who've got a genuine interest in sport and are thinking about whether it's for them or not. So they were really good questions. I appreciate that and I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to join you from the other side of the world. <laughs> Sounds good. And we uh, hope and wish to welcome you very soon when you do visit um, out here or if we are in Victoria very soon. But on that note, thank you so much, Professor. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, um, for any questions, feel free to email us. Um, otherwise, have a great Thursday evening um, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you.